JP Sachs is here. What up, VJ? How are you? I'm having a lovely morning, and I'm very happy to talk to you. I am so happy to finally see you in person because I, I feel it's like so nice. every time we talk, it's on Zoom or you know during COVID. You 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 have a kinder demeanor in three dimensions. Do I? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I feel very welcome. How are you? Well, um, I'm happy. My we were just talking about the uh, intricacies of our our sleeping habits. Yes, yes, yes. So my eyes are not as itchy as they were when I woke up, and <laughs> your headache's going away. Yes, is it going away, or am I just forcing? No, it's going away. You? I took um I took a Benadryl before, not a Benadryl, the uh, Sudafed ah, before you walked in. Nice. So it's slowly going away. I appreciate that this interview required medication. Well, <laughs> it's me waking up in the morning that requires super med- medication. Yeah, I'm not even caffeinated. No? Yeah, you're getting uncaffeinated me. And that I really have to trust someone to interact with them uncaffeinated. I feel like I have earned your trust, yes. You played my r- songs on the radio really early, and I mm-hmm. think that means we have an inseparable bond. Yes, I remember um, um, If the World Was Ending. Yeah, you like did it on a, a countdown. I, yes. I heard your voice. and It was one of the first times I ever sat in the car and heard a song on the radio was you introducing it. And that's was special. it really? Yeah. How did that feel? Uh, how did it feel? It's like tapping into that 14-year-old in you who's passing out. Mm-hmm. At something happening that seemed unimaginable, I wish I had kept the car I had when I was nineteen for that moment because it would have been cooler. Like to do it, to like listen to it in my four hundred dollar Chrysler LeBaron that I got for you know when I was nineteen and slept in for six months. Mm. Like it would have been cool to listen in that car. But I'm over optimizing the situation. It was really cool. It was exactly what it, what it should have been with Hope- your voice introducing it. I was about to say, hopefully, I ju- I did it justice because I remember you tweeted me. You were in the car driving around and you tweeted me when I when uh-huh. I played it. I think I was in the Subaru. You were. Yeah, I'm still in it. I I love that for you. Thanks. That you were able to experience that. You mentioned you were sleeping in a car. Why, why were you sleeping in a car? Oh, or? well, it was when I first moved to Los Angeles. And I wanted to be able to feel like I had a come-up story 10 years later. So was that just an... <laughs> 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 so basically, it was an option. Well, it was, <laughs> what did you say? So basically, it was an option, you sleeping in a car. Like, what? that was just you well, doing no, it for... I didn't, I didn't, like... When I first moved to Los Angeles, I didn't, like, have a place to stay yet. Oh, okay. But I would go to open mics. This was one of my main moves. I would go to open mics. I learned very young mm-hmm. that people were more willing to talk to me after I sang for them. I think this tracks to this day. Like, if I sing, I'm less shy because people just talk to me, and then I can just say things back. But, you know, if you hang out with a bunch of strangers, you know, it's hard to talk to strangers. They're terrifying at the beginning. Usually wonderful because they're just humans. Very hard connection to make. Strangers or humans? Anyways. Mm-hmm. So when I first moved to Los Angeles, I would go to open mics. I would uh, I would sing. People would say things to me. And then I would try and make friends so I could sleep on their couch. That was, one of my, that was one of my original, you know, find housing plans in Los Angeles. You know what drives me crazy? I think the whole small talk of it first. Like when you're first meeting someone new and you're talking to them and you're talking about the, the smallest things that no one necessarily cares about. Yeah, skip it. You just got to go weird as possible from the jump. Like, like just how? Just ask people like the weirdest things. All right, so you're just now meeting me. Yeah, if you had to do a marketing campaign for any animal on earth, what would it be? A sloth. Why? Because I feel like I am very parallel to a sloth. Right, I like over, to sleep. Over I'm or underrated s- sloths? Huh? Over or underrated sloths? Um, Underrated sloths. Why are they underrated? Because I feel like there's just this and stop it. I see what you're doing. So I get it now. You don't necessarily We're have to. We're not talking have the, about the weather, EJ. Right. You don't necessarily have to do the small talk. You can just bring out the whole weirdness yeah. of it all. Or I can ask you, would you rather would you rather be able to f- fly or breathe underwater? Breathe underwater. I feel That's like. my choice too, because I'm afraid of drowning. That's my and I'm a Pisces, I'm a water sign. And I love to be around water, but I'm not going too far into it. Yeah, but if you can breathe underwater... It, you, it'll be fine. Yeah, but you can still get messed up by the fish. The scary I mean, fish. what, a shark? That's a scary fish. I mean, dolphins bully sharks. Dolphins, I think, are an overrated animal. Did I, you know that? This became quite the controversy on my Instagram recently. Go ahead. Well, because I said something... I don't remember what the context was. There was probably no context. I was probably just being dorky and random like usual. Um, but I said something about dolphins being evil because people keep telling me dolphins are evil. Allegedly. I don't have evidence to. So I'm not a marine biologist. Let me tell you, I know a story where a dolphin <laughs> saved somebody's life. Sure. And I feel like I hear that all the time. I mean, I feel like maybe the problem here is that we're not applying a broad enough, nuanced 
perspective. Mm-hmm. Like if a species doing evil things makes the species evil, then humans are evil. So just True. because there are some evil dolphins doesn't mean we can't still love the cuddly ones that are in captivity at SeaWorld. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like those. I think. I think that company uh-huh. makes the dolphins evil, potentially. Don't you think? Like they are used to the whole open sea floor, mm-hmm. and then you're like held in a uh, a tank the size of this room. Wouldn't that make you crazy? Free the dolphins, right? Free dolphins. Yeah, that's gonna be our next Instagram campaign. And rebrand campaign. the sloths. Yes, I think sloths have a great reputation. People love them. I no. I was just saying that I feel like I am. Comparable to a sloth. Yeah. One of my best friends is obsessed with sloths. Mainly because I'm like always sleepy. I'm always tired. Uh huh. I move slow as hell. I think they've ever tried to give caffeine to a sloth and see what happens. I feel like that would be a great like project. Don't you think? SeaWorld would do it. I'm sure. <laughs> they have a propensity for cruelty. I'm not going to do it. That seems mean. What if like our heart beats too fast? But also, like, I don't think a sloth's a sea animal, so I don't think that it'll end up. I at know sea it was world. more about their moral compass than it was about their expertise. Absolutely. So you won't be going there anytime soon. I've never been. Me neither. Yeah. Just doesn't seem like my kind of place. Yeah. I swam with dolphins in the ocean once. How was that? Terrifying. It was so scary. Why? I've never been so afraid of a shade of blue. I I like put my face into the water. It was in Portugal, and we were like in the middle of the ocean. And I put my face into the water, and mm-hmm. it was just this, it looked like space. It was so scary. I felt insignificant. That's, you know, where, whenever, whenever you feel too big for your britches, is that the word, bridges, britches? I actually don't know what that means. Whenever you're, I know what it means, but I don't know what it means. Whenever you feel like you are too big, uh-huh. you go to the water, yeah. and that, like, brings you down to size. And deeply insignificant, and I didn't like it. Yeah. Is that <laughs> why you're scared of water? The insignificance and lack of control? Yeah. Probably. I think that's why I can't stand flying. Why? Because I'm not in control. Yeah. Deeply. I mean, you're never in control, but it's it sucks to be reminded of it. I um I tell people all the time, when you get out of high school, you're never in control. You think you're in control of a situation? You're not. Ever. I am far more in control of my life now than I was in high school. But that's because I was a loser in high school. You were. For all of the reasons that my life is wonderful now. Because you it's, were singing and write songs and stuff? Yeah, basically. I say this when I'm when I meet like younger fans. Just pay attention to the things that people make fun of you for when you're 16, because the things you get made fun of for as a kid are usually the things that make your life unique and wonderful when you're older. Mm. Right? Because I got made fun of for being sensitive. I got made fun of for singing. I got made fun of for being a ginger. Now that's my whole thing. Yeah. What would they say to you for being a ginger? Kids they, they are so damn me, cruel. They used to call me uh, booger brows. Which is hilarious. And I like the alliteration. I don't get But now that. I don't have the emotional attachment, so I can just see it objectively for its humor. I don't understand booger brows. Well, though. look. They're like booger colored. Oh. What? No. Because well, I have like blondish, like dirty blondish eyebrows. Mine are normally like green. Green? Yeah. You dye them green? Mm-mm. Not my eyebrows, the boogers. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, got it, got it. Off the that rails. That tracks. <laughs> Real quick, tell me about the new song. Oh, I Don't Miss You. Yes. My new song is called I Don't Miss You. Okay. It's a lie. Really? Well, yeah. It's a lie. It's a song It's a song about trying to contextualize the, the feelings that you'd rather not feel. It's a song about trying to find ways to, to tell yourself that the emotions that you are trying to avoid you don't have. You just, uh, can, if you can maybe look at them for the right angle, they'll be easier to figure out. You know, I don't miss you. I just fantasize about you being someone who loves me. It's not fair to anybody, but I just can't get you off of my mind. I don't miss you. I just fantasize about you being someone who loves me. I can't help it how I dream as if you're painted on the back of my back of my eyes. I don't miss you. I just think about you all the time. It's absurd. Do you ever get in your head? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get in your head when you write a song about something or someone uh-huh. And think about like how they're gonna feel whenever they hear it. Yeah, I'm I'm not a I'm not psychotic. I I consider other people's emotions. So how do you deal with that? Like when it comes to the song, you're still gonna put it out anyway. Like how do you release that and set that free? How do I? So you're asking me how do I contextualize my consideration of other people's emotions in a song about how I'm trying to recontextualize my own feelings about other people's emotions? Yeah, it's kind of meta in a way. And it's it's not oxymoronic, but a little bit. 
Yeah, I mean, I think when you live a life where your emotions are tied up in your art, you have to consider the real world implications of the art you are creating. Yeah. One more time. (laughs) Well, I mean, my job is turning my reality, my emotions, my feelings into art. And I, for better or for worse, have never created art from a place other than my own life, my own sincerity, my own experience, my own reality. So, yeah, there is the consideration of how, you know, how the songs I am writing intertwine with the reality of the emotions I'm writing them about. I'll give you an example. I have a song called The Few Things. A mm-hmm. um, love song I wrote it like five years ago. And the girl I wrote it about uh, just got married. And she invited me to the wedding, which was very kind of her. <laughs> but I had to say... Plot twist. I had to say, I'm sorry, I can't make it to the wedding. I'm playing Madison Square Garden that night. Um, and then I got to tell that story at Madison Square Garden, opening for John Mayer, singing a love song about someone getting married. <laughs> well, she wasn't getting married when I wrote it. That's... I mean, no, but they're just, they're just the, the... I know, but so, you, so sometimes rea- when you make art about your emotions, those emotions and that reality and those songs kind of intertwine themselves into strange little situations. She was getting married on the same day? Yeah, yeah. As you were playing Madison Square Garden? Yeah. Was that... I don't want to be petty, uh-huh. but I am going to be. Go for it. Has, th- did that feel like, not necessarily poetic justice, but did that feel good? That had to feel good. I mean, it... It felt good because I was happy that her life looked like something that was meant for her and my life looked like something that was meant for me. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation with friends yesterday about uh, being grateful for the failures at things that weren't meant for you. You know, I am a firm believer of what's meant for you is for you and what's meant for someone else is for someone else. Exactly. And absolutely, I'm grateful and, you know, I pray for the, for the things I'm grateful for, the, for the blessings in my life. But I also am grateful and pray for the things that aren't meant for me that, that I failed at. I'm grateful for the failures of things that were not meant for me, and that relationship was one of them. What, what, are, what do you feel like you failed in that relationship? That, that one, like a long time ago? Yes. I don't feel like it was necessarily a failure of, of who I was or the relationship itself. I think the love is really beautiful. I'm a strong believer that love can be valid without being endless. I think the idea that the only version of valid love is the one that ends in death is absurd. I think there can be really, really beautiful, contained, relationships that end um but i would say as a 24 year old i didn't know how to allow myself to be loved and flawed i didn't know how to allow myself to be vulnerable with someone i didn't know how to i thought loving someone meant showing up as my best self at all times Mm -hmm. not showing up as my most honest self at all times god so when you said being loved and Uh flawed Uh uh-huh explain that for me well in order to be loved, you have to let yourself be flawed in front of someone else. If if you love someone so much that you want to just be the best version of yourself for them at all times, and therefore you're not showing them the parts of yourself that you're afraid of, you're not letting them love the parts of you that you're afraid of, and that's off, often when you can feel the most intimacy with another person. Mm. Coming from a songwriter with no credibility on the subject. I'm saying, though, but you know what you feel. These are my feelings, yes. I have credibility on my feelings. Do you think that that's what... Can break or what's breaking up relationships now, like how you said, people are always showing up being their perfect self, but not necessarily like being their true, honest self. You know what I mean? I think a lot of times people think that you have to be perfect in these relationships and not show that vulnerability. Maybe. I also think sometimes what's breaking up relationships is two people who aren't meant to be together. Yeah. And I think a lot of times people try to force relationships that aren't necessarily. I think we mistake really incredible people for really incredible relationships. Mm. You can have, you can be with an extraordinary person and recognize that it's not the right relationship and that doesn't make that person any less extraordinary. Absolutely. Is there, do you think that you can break up with someone and still be like cool in the end? Yeah. You do? I mean, I am cool with people that I am no longer with. Like the girl who just got married. <laughs> True. Because she invited you to said wedding. Yeah. And you would have went. Yeah. Would you have stood up and been like, I contest. I'm a, gl- I'm a glutton for emotional tumultuousness. Clearly. I'm a songwriter. <laughs> it's my whole thing. Is that therapeutic for you? 
Um, yeah. Well, yes and no. Yes, because creating a song out of a feeling means taking that feeling, putting in, putting it in something other than your chest. Mm-hmm. And having that emotion in something other than your chest is cathartic. Right. But that same tool, the song that's taken the emotion out of you, a year later when that emotion is no longer in you at all, that song's now putting that same feeling right back into you. So, double-edged sword. It has to feel good releasing that, though, and it's not here. You know what I mean? Yes. At first, it does feel good. It feels very, I mean, look, I'm extraordinarily grateful that songs are my life, that I get to, I get to analyze myself for a living and then create little little song babies that then get to go run around the world and help other people understand themselves and their relationships better. It's a cool way to live. I feel purposeful and, and grateful that, that that's what my days and nights look like. I say this all the time. The 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 journey that a song takes mm-hmm. is remarkable. Mm-hmm. Like wherever you write said song at, mm-hmm. wherever you record said song at, mm-hmm. put song into the world. Mm-hmm. The fact that that song is able to go out and touch, physically touch people and get them through certain situations that apply to them because I'm not necessarily sure that it's it, that intent like to help people. You're just getting it out of your system for you. Well, e- EJ, I had this like realization a few years ago. That uh-huh. was really liberating for me. That uh, the superpower of being an artist is recognizing all of the ways that you're basic, not all the ways that you're exceptional. Like my songs are meaningful because I'm a basic human being feeling basic human things. And I just happen to be able to put them into songs and other people relate to them because I'm just a human experiencing human things. Mm. Just like you're a human experiencing human things. So if I can get my song to feel like my human experience, it's very likely it's going to feel like a part of yours too. Because like we're out here feeling the same things. Like I don't miss you. I wrote mostly in Colombia. I wrote most of my album in Colombia. Um, last May, I went and spent a month taking a Spanish lesson every morning, going to the studio every day and just sitting at a piano and writing. Nice. And now those songs that just... You know, showed up at the piano, looking over a city that I'd never been in before. Or songs I get to sing with people in all kinds of cities all over the world. And as we talk about the feelings we're lying to ourselves about. What sparked a Columbia trip? I wanted to learn Spanish. That's it. Well, do you want the, like, short answer or the emotional answer? <laughs> get, I'm a Pisces, so I want to be in my feels this whole interview. Go ahead. Um, Well, it was, I think... After someone passes, Mm -hmm. it is possible to not just continue to have a relationship with that person, but even develop your relationship with that person, to grow your relationship with that person, to expand your relationship with that person. Um, My mom passed three years ago, and she was a fluent Spanish speaker, went to elementary school in Cuba. It was her first language, one of her first language, learned it at the same time as English, but she never taught me Spanish. Uh, So for me, like part of my grieving process was learning how to know my mom in ways that I didn't get to while she was alive. And to me, learning Spanish was representative of that. And being in South America and being surrounded by a new community and, you know, a new feeling of what it felt like to be myself. And not just learning this new language, but learning what it felt to be myself in a new language. And it made me feel very close to her, made me feel close to myself, and I got to be creative in that process. So that's why I wanted to learn. That's a, that's, see, I, I love that answer. It's true. <laughs> and it's almost, was it your... Your way of uh, connecting with her. Do you feel like she gave you inspiration throughout that whole album, writing while being in Colombia and learning Spanish, or no? Uh, maybe. Um, I've only ever written one song about her. It's on my first album. It's called Sing Myself to Sleep. But, I don't know, you know, parents are complicated. Like, I had a complicated relationship with my mom because she was always a much more impressive person than she was a parent but you know with her not being here anymore i get to choose the parts of her that i want to have a relationship with Mm. and i remember watching her speak spanish with people thinking like who is this happy joyful charismatic woman like i don't really know her you know what's interesting the same way with my dad Uh like i would see him be this super charismatic person. Like everybody, you, they would run into me because he was a he was a cop in the city. They would run into me, and be like, "Oh my gosh, you're a dad!" Da, 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 da. And I'm like, "Who is this person that they're talking about?" Yeah. Because I never seen that person. Yeah. So I can relate 100. percent Yeah. Like in 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 Spanish, she was like, she was joyful. She was emotional. She was so present. And and you know, the mom that I knew like was the mom I would get home and we'd be drunk every day. Mm-hmm. Like that was my predominant experience of her was just a violent alcoholic, <laughs> right? Um, but 
I remember what it felt like to see her in Spanish. I remember that joy. I remember how her eyes lit up. And I wanted to have a relationship with that version of my mom. Like, that's what I want to hold on to. So when I speak Spanish, when I'm with my Spanish-speaking community, like, I feel close to myself in a part of me where I'm, I'm close to the part of myself that's connected to her. Mm. And that feels really healing. Man. Well, tell me, what are you working on next? Well, I get to make all the art for the album. So the album's done. I turned in my master's today. Okay. The album's done. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, I once you turn that. into master's, is it like done? Can you not go back and be like, let me tweak this. Let me do this. I mean, not without a number of people being angry at me. I mean, but it's your project. I could. I don't think I'm going to do that. Okay. Have you ever? I mean, I've only had one other album. And the first one took me like five years. This one took me two. Okay. Did I make any changes after it was done? You know what? Once you leave it enough weeks, like you're going to want to change things because you changed. <laughs> Yeah. So you're now looking at this art from a different perspective because you now have a different perspective because you're, you know, a month newer. Um, so, so you I, just have to let it go. Yeah, basically. Um, so I've let it go, and now I get to spend the, you know, the rest of the summer uh, making the art around it, making all the videos, making all, the, you know, shooting the album cover, doing all that kind of stuff, which is really exciting. It's exciting to like tell the stories in in as many forms as possible because there's a lot of conversations with myself on this album, and I want to let people in on those conversations from as many windows and doors as possible. Can I just say it was so much fun chatting with you? So much fun talking with you too. I'm so glad that you uh, came and hung out with me in person. Thanks for being a home base for my music. I appreciate it so much, and for me today. Of course, come back whenever you want. No, well, I live like 15 minutes from here. Where? Uh, All right, hold on. JP Sacks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, DJ. Thank you, thank you, thank you.